We just got cocky, full of ourselves, not looking after the member well, more importantly, even not looking after the staff very well. We just got bloody complacent. Welcome to the Escape Your Limits podcast. And today's guest is a resilient business leader that I've watched navigate his way through a series of industry challenges and overcome many obstacles. Today, he's overseeing the Life Fit Group's six successful brands, including Fitness First, Barry's Bootcamp, Elba Gym, Smile X, and the Gym Society. In our conversation, we go deep on a number of subjects, including how to lead in times of crisis, lessons from the rise and fall of one of the biggest fitness brands in Europe, and the highs and lows of reopening after COVID. I've got a lot of respect for what this gentleman has achieved and overcome. And by the end of the interview, I think you'll realize how he got to the position of where he is today. So please welcome Mr. Martin Seibold to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Martin Seibold, thank you so much for joining us on the Escape Your Limits podcast. Um, you look as though you're somewhere quite sunny. Uh, where, where are you today? I'm today at home in the southern part of England. And as we know, England is always sunny, at least in the heart. So uh, we are fine. Right. I, I wasn't. Uh, Wendy mentioned that you're, you're living in England. For some reason, I, I thought you was in Germany. How, how long have you been living in England? I've been in England since 2006, since uh, the very famous Mike Balfour, from, the founder from Fitness First, dragged me over after I had a stunt of eight years in Germany, run the business for him there. He said, Martin, I need help in England. Please come over. And um, I was very fortunate that I was traveling, reporting the, uh, the numbers of the German business every month. So I knew pool, I knew the area, and I dragged my wife over uh, on a uh, most sunny January the 7th of 2006. And it was raining and bad weather and cold in Germany. And England was just stunning sunshine, palm trees, 12 degrees for the whole weekend. I think I've never seen in, in all my uh, 20, 14 years in England another January day like this. But she came over, had the best weekend, said, Martin, when can we move? <laughs> Fantastic. That, that doesn't sound, the way you described it doesn't remind me of England. So you're, you're obviously in a, a wonderful part of the country where you've got your own weather system by the sound of things. <laughs> It is true because we have the uh, second largest natural uh, harbour after Sydney. So wow. the pool harbour is actually quite big. So we do a lot of pedal boarding here, lots of windsurfing, kite surfing, uh, motor sport, uh, water sports. So it's, it's a really lovely place and I'm very fortunate that Fitness First started off here. Right. So for those of you who, who don't know you, it would be good maybe just give us a bit of an overview. I, I know, I think I'm, I must have met you about 20 years ago, I think in a, in a restaurant in Holland or some, somewhere like that with a group of people when Fitness First, I remember, I remember sitting around the table and it was at the days when Fitness First was just starting. I think you, you were probably called Fitness Company at the time and I remember they were opening the Dutch operation and I think that's where we, we, we first, sort of first met each other. But give us a bit of a background of how you, know, how you got into the fitness industry and, and you know, the sort of transition to, to where you are today. Absolutely. And you're right. It was actually a Japanese restaurant in Holland <laughs> and uh, um, we ate all these funny things. And obviously the Dutch people have a really funny way, you know, about approaching life and they did the same with the food. So I was a little bit, but but we were, were okay. So um, yeah, no, look, my my family owned a, a gym in uh, in Germany in Frankfurt. It was a ladies only gym, and uh, it was pretty unique in the nineties of of the last century. And they were actually the very first Ursa international member uh, in the entire world in Germany. So 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 we had good, you know, uh, and I was an intern at Ursa in 1992 uh, in Boston, the first international student who did a three month work experience there. So I'm in this industry for quite a while and my family business got bought by Fitness First. Hmm. And, uh, and they uh, wanted to uh, hire uh, people in order to, uh, to, to grow the business. And I actually said to Mike Balfour, you know, Mike, um, 
it's nice to be getting involved, but unless you promise me you can build a hundred sites in Germany, I'm not interested. I studied sports management. I'm ambitious. I want to do something really big. And with six clubs in Frankfurt, that's not really uh, interesting for me. And he said, okay, we're going to do this. And, uh, and, uh, and surely he did. You know, uh, Fitness First once was 100 gyms in Germany. So uh, he kept his promise. Right. And, and you know, the, the interesting thing, I guess, about that business was it was, um, you know, I, I was very involved because we, we were fortunate to be one of the first suppliers um, when Mike was there and um, Sean Phillips. In fact, I, I remember going to the office in Paul, probably not far from where you are. And, um, you know, the, the process was I used to come there with a bunch of samples and Sean would show them to Mike and Mike would stick his thumb up and, and that was it. It was like, yeah, OK, we're going to put this in our club. So it was quite a... An interesting company that started very, very small and expanded massively, um, and and obviously is is not really around too much nowadays. So, what what are some of the you know from being on that journey as a you know small club and taking it to where it is, and then sort of seeing it come full circle? What what are some of the lessons that you've learned as a as a leader in the in the fitness industry from that? As you would say, times when they look good are never as good as they shine, and when they are bad, they're not as bad as they look. And I think we are in the same situation right now, uh, similarly. But um, look, we have had some tremendous years. I, I joined the business in, in 1998 in Germany uh, as a marketing manager. And we had six gyms. And, uh, and, and I was uh, brought to the table to open the sevens and then expand the business. And within six years, we had almost 90 gyms. So it was fabulous. The UK at that time had 17 gyms. And it, you know, it had over 100 uh, in, in this time frame. And it started to roll out into Holland. It started to roll out into France and, and, and Spain. Then Australia came on board, then Asia. So it, it was an immendous uh, uh, growth story. Um, so, so in a way, um, you know, it was on the stock exchange. There was a lot of money around. And, uh, and, uh, and, and everything was focused on expansion. And, and I think that was the, the big mistake at that stage, that we never really looked on the existing business. And, and that's something, you know, which has been true over the, the, the next 10 years I've been involved with the business, that if you don't look after your member, your existing member, and you don't look after your staff and your teams, then, you know, you might have a, a couple of five, 10 years good role, but in the long term, you will not be successful. And I think that strategy really only um, hit us really when in 2005, a, um, no, sorry, in uh, 2012, a possible um, um, listing on the stock exchange evaporated. And I think since then, you know, uh, Fitness First has been on a more humble road and on a more um, um, focus to the member and the team's um, activity. Mm. So would, would you say then it was the, the, the sort of... Um... I guess the focus of the company, as you say, was on expansion and it was probably just keeping the investors happy because they wanted to see lots and lots of sites opening. And um, so you were very successful at doing that. But once that changed and, and um, you know, that, that wasn't probably quite as important, they, they struggled to make the shift to, to sustain the business. Then is that is that pretty much what happened? Yeah, and I think that's in every relationship, you know, whether it's private, whether it's business, you know, if you if you just look after to, to you know, to, to gain, to grow and to do this, and you're not looking after the partnership, then, then you struggle. And I think there's numerous examples in the health club industry who have done the same thing. You know, we remember all 24 hour being once the biggest in the world, you know, we had, um, you had other um, uh, gym change, Healthland, you had... Uh, curves you know you had so many chains who focused on expansion and time will tell you know when companies like anytime like f45 when when they really when they really move so fast you know is this the right angle so what we've done with with the business nowadays here is that we have set it up as a multi business company multi brand company so we formed life with group um, last year and we have added um, um, other brands to our facilities. We've done. We've now had have uh, Fitness First in Germany with around 60 gyms. We have um, about 20 gyms which are in the low cost segment, um, and they're expanding fast. 
Um, we have Barry's Boot Camp opening up um, as the boutique offering around for 20 years, slow ramp up. Um, so, so really focus on quality uh, coming in, in Frankfurt in, in October and then in, in Berlin in January next year. You know, so, so we really start to di differentiate and to diversify. And I believe this is something which is happening in the industry that you, the consumer has changed with all these offerings and all these new initiatives. And I think when you are focused on one model only, then you struggle over a 20 year lease to maybe have just one offering in that lease. So we have started to convert some of the fitness first now into the Smilex brand. We're looking even in one of the smaller fitness first to, to put the berries in. So, so it gives you more flexibility. That's why we believe something like this is potentially the right future to really focus what does the customer in that location really want. Mm. And and with some of the, the lessons then um, from the the sort of scale rapidly model, um, you know, do you, do you as well as providing different solutions for for, for the customer, do do you think there's any operational things that can do so you kind of get that balance between just opening locations but ensuring that you're building a business that's that's sustainable? So you know, is it having more focus on Looking at you know, simple as it sounds, just more focus on trying to you know provide good value to, to the customers that are coming in, or you know, is is there any other things that you've seen that you know if you'd have done that fitness first thing again that you'd have said, well, okay, I'm just I'm gonna I'm gonna do this differently now. Yeah, that's a very good point. I think what 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 really works well is if you have different teams working on the individual activities if i would do it again i would have a teams for clubs who are open longer than a year ago and and then you have clubs who are open longer than maybe three years ago and then you obviously have a pre-opening team and i think because the 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 nature of the business and and who is the customer in those sites changes and uh, uh, and and i guess that's the big learning that you need sp specific teams for certain areas um, you can't have someone who is doing pre-opening and, and trying to fill a gym at the same time looking at a gym who is three or five years open who just need to maintain the membership level. It's just two different skill sets. One is a hunter and the other one is a farmer. But mm -hmm. that's definitely a learning we would apply. Mm. Yeah, interesting. And what about the role as a leader? You know, you've you've been at the head um, and, and your team that you've put around you of, of, of a lot of people, a lot of organizations, a lot of across a lot of different regions with um, you know, very, very different sort of ideas. What, what are some of the things that you've learned over that time as a leader? Um, and, and I suppose, where are you now compared to where you were when you was in the middle of all that expansion? Wow, that's a big question, isn't it? <laughs> Um, I guess you learn to how you be a leader. You actually learn in your private life. You know, the, the, the personality you develop there. And when I look back at my childhood, you know, I have, I've never been the most popular kid in the class, you know, but I've always been given responsibility. You know, I was, a, was, a, was one of the head boys in the school. I was um, with the scouts. I then um, um, developed into um, a person who is in a team. I was actually, despite only being 5.9, a decent basketball player. I would do that. <laughs> um, and, uh, um, so, you know, very passionate. I, I'm not very good in individual sport. I'm better as a team player. And not because I'm actually, okay, I had a decent uh, three-point shoot range. I even could dunk. Um, but, you know, I never become a Michael Jordan. But um, um, but. I could get the best out of my team. And, and I think when I, when I look at all the things I've learned um, throughout my private life, um, you, you become a personality. And when you're then in the job, you apply those, um, those um, learnings you've, you, you, you got. So in, in the job, I've had 21 positions in those um, 20 years at Fitness First and our life at group. And, um, and I had numerous positions at the same time. And... What I always find is, is that I just wake up and I'm interested in 
almost everything. I'm interested at one moment how you, you know, how you take a shower head apart and, and how you really do that or an air condition. And at the same time, I'm interested in how are the sales number working? How you do a sales call? Uh, you know, what's the email? How does it have to say? And when you have an interest in what your teams are doing, you find out, can they do their job? And I've surrounded myself with people who are much better at the individual task than I ever been. So I was a marketing director at one of my positions. You know what? Wrong guy for marketing in general. But I could judge my team around me, you know, do they, can they do marketing? So actually, I was the, the right position because I could really get them, you know, the, the online guys, I could get the, the, the CRM guys, I could get the people who, who do the outreach, I could get them by asking good questions to, to achieve their maximum and their potential. And I I think as a leader, it's it's important that you show interest in what your teams are doing and um, that you actually also understand maybe 40, 50 percent of what they're talking about. So you can judge, do they actually, you know, do they do the right thing? Are they on the right track? Do I need to fill in? Do I need to say, oh, maybe you ask to this agency or you bring a new team player in? I think that's one of some of the learnings learnings you get over the years. Mm, yeah. How was it when when you was part of the, the DW, um, I guess, transition? You know, was what, what was that like as a, I suppose, because you've got two very different cultures. You know, you've got a, a DW Fitness that was, you know, a, a sort of a Northern England um, sort of mid-market club and then Fitness First that particularly in London were doing some really innovative stuff at the time on the small group training. In fact, they're probably, you know, even today, some of the things that they do are, uh, you know, are far ahead of a, a lot of organizations. How, how did you, how was that to try and sort of merge those, those cult, two, two different sort of cultures and I suppose business um, strategies together? Well, first I need to give you a good elbow check with the one I'm not sneezing into because that was really cool. But you <laughs> recognize the functional training being some of the, and of course, you have been a huge help at that stage because, you know, when we started to look at this whole, you know, we call it freestyle, the world wasn't looking at that. Only PTs were doing this. So you helped us to make this mainstream. And, and a lot of other companies have done this now. But yes, we, we, we hope that we are still um, with our small group training and all this um, pretty, pretty good. Um, look, the reality is, is um, DW bought us for exact that, re that reason. And it takes a business to acknowledge that they do a lot of things good, but in some business parts, they are not so good. And that's why they really liked it. They wanted the London footprint, but they also wanted the know-how and the skill set. And I'm quite proud that my original team who, who joined DW with me is, or is still there. You know, and that was always the plan. You know, that, and, and now the team is, you know, they are responsible for the overall for all business, not just the 60 Fitness First, but they're also now responsible for the 70 DW, and now it's joint DW Fitness First. So, so it's a really win-win situation for both companies that they merged because they were big enough to say, we have a weakness in an area. And, uh, and from what I hear from the guys is that they are still um, you know, doing the innovation. One of the famous things we're doing, you know, every two months, there is a new kind of equipment coming in, whether it's um, just a small little thing, um, which is out in, in, in industry or whether it's an assault bike or a ski work, you know, it could vary. But every two months, there is a new initiative coming in. And, uh, and that's still the case. Um, in par with um, 10 minute workouts and digital. So in a way, they have kept this kind of innovative uh, spirit and have dragged it over into the into the other part of the company. So it's it's it's, it's quite a success story, I believe. Mm. And and with the um, you know with, uh, with as, as it relates to the Fitness First Germany business, then you I know for quite some time, um, you know, you, there you were looking at one point to probably sell or move on the business um, to, to to maybe somebody else. What was the what was the sort of turning point where you, you you sort of decided okay well we'll um you know we're gonna we're gonna stay with it and we're gonna build this um sort of you know house of of different brands to complement the fitness first business well first in 2017 when i left dw 
and I joined the German part uh, first of May, I I actually didn't join as an employee. I actually joined as a consultant because within the Fitness First family, the German business didn't have the best of reputations, um, and uh, it was underinvested. There was no there was no real values. Uh, there were um, um, they were focused on some new business um, areas outside the core business. Um, they so there was a lot of things, and I just had feeling, ooh, you know, is this the right place for me? And so I looked at it for three months, and and I saw the massive opportunity this business had because the locations are unbeatable, and we know people join for location and then for for price and quality. So so that most important part was ticked, and then you know money can fix a lot of things. So you know the the private equity house we work with Oak Tree, you know when you when they are convinced that you can get a good return of investment, they're business people, and we have shown this kind of um, reinvigorating fitness first in the UK. We have shown that in Australia, in Asia. So we knew the program. So we knew if we take you know and apply this, it's not just going to be lipstick on a pig. It's going to be from inside out, a really good change to the business, and. Um, and and we did all that. We invested the capital. We changed the product. We changed all the facilities and all this. It's it's Im- incredibly well invested at this moment in time. Um, but the heart of the business is the difficult one. You need to change what you do with the people. You know, it's unionized. One of the only few chains in the world. Um, so so you know, we have 42 unions with 60 gyms. You know, so that you, that that's a big undertaking, you know, and uh, uh, and in a way, you know, we really work with them, and we really found I found that they were really um, wanting to make the changes this business needed to to do. So I worked really closely with them, and and they're really good partners now, and we've reduced the unions. We're not 42 anymore. We are now like 11, you know. So there's a lot of trust there. Um, so we had the facilities, we had the equipment, and we had the people. But we had no story because in that upper market for fitness first, where do you go? You're in metropolitan areas. You have, you know, 10 sites in Frankfurt, eight sites in Frankfurt. You have you have five sites in Cologne. You have 12 sites in Berlin. There's not room to double the business. It's not like in the UK where you have 27 fitness first and you can do in London alone, you know, 45, 50. So there's no real story. So you need to create something. Also, we saw that some of our sites were still, despite all the investment, despite the good people, you know, working really well, they were still under threat and not successful anymore because competition is coming to town. So we had no solution for them other than to sell them. I had to sell eight sites and I hate that. Every single time I hate that because someone puts a new logo on top and that's a worse job, cheaper, no investment, not looking after the members and makes a lot of money, at least in the short term. So we said we can do that ourselves. So we looked in the market, in the German market, look at all the value operators. And then we decided for one, Smilex, because we felt their system, their personality, their leadership, um, their their processes, and, and their whole value system was very similar to ours. And luckily, the CEO and myself and the management team, we got along incredibly well. You know, so we said, OK, let's let's go together. At the same time, we looked at the higher end of the market because we know from Equinox, we know from from Virgin, we know from Aspria and and all these chains that there is a market over fitness first. You know, we if the fitness first is the E class Mercedes, there is an S class. You know, so we looked at that and we found L gym, which is it's a fabulous gym, slightly more expensive and uh, even closer relationship with the, with the member. So we said, OK. Why don't why don't why don't we do it with that kind of? We have the management team. We need brand teams who deliver on their on their promise. But all the background work, IT, financial, you know, website, digital, and all this, you can you can you can do that centrally. And we had a solution for Fitness First, so we converted some of the Fitness First into a Smilex. And you know what? Same location, same people, but a different brand with a different promise, cheaper. And suddenly you had from three and a half thousand members, you go to four and a half, <laughs> you know. And uh, so, so in a way, you know, um, we, 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 and now we have the story. 
So now, Oakley, you know, if we wouldn't have had Corona, you know, this business would have now been valued real decent and probably sold at, at the moment we are speaking because it has a real growth story. You know, the Smilex brand can heal, really grow. We've added the boutique market because we know the boutique market is, was the fastest growing market segment. You know, so we got Barry's Bootcamp. It should have opened in May. It's now opening in October. You know, um, um, we have the exponential brands not far from where you are in New York. Yes. Obviously, you know, Anthony and their team, John Kirsch and the guys, you know, we got actually, you know, we have the Club Pilates and Pure Bar brands for Germany and Austria as a license, but we haven't opened, started them yet for, for the obvious reason. So in a way, it was natural to kind of say, what are we going to do with the business and what's the, and we looked internationally. I mean, there's so many brands who are multi-brand who are successful, Equinox with, with, with all the brands they have, and on top of it, Blink and, and, and SoulCycle, you know. But then you have in Australia, you have the the, the team around, you know, with, with Fitness First as its as its core and Good Life, and and all the other brands on top of it. Um, also Barry's Bootcamp. Um, you have in Asia that group. So I think that over time, this multi-brand. You look at hotel industry. I mean, Marriott is not just Marriott; it's 17 other hotels. Hmm. You know, so so in a way, it's it's the natural thing for the market leaders to develop into a multi-brand, but it gives also us a story, and a growth story going forward to expand. Hmm. It it sounds like I guess it, it's a relatively new thing for the fitness space. I guess because the fitness industry is relatively new compared to hospitality. Um, in terms of lessons with putting together a multi-brand um, strategy, you know, is it, do you tend to start in, um, in, in like a single market? So let's say Germany, where it's like, okay, well, we can't grow any more fitness first in Frankfurt, which, which is what you recognized. And so what we'll now do is we'll create the sort of multi-brand so that we can tap into a, a wider audience. In your experience, is it better to sort of get it right in one market and then take that internationally or do you do both at the same time? What, what's your thoughts on how that concept scales? Well, the lesson from Fitness First is don't go into the market when you don't have a local man management team. You know, you, you cannot come from another, all the, all the things where the management team came from another country and did another country with them, they all failed, at least at Fitness First. So we would never go into Austria or Switzerland with one of the brands just from Frankfurt. You know, so we need to get the model working in Germany. And when we are confident that it works here, that we understand the consumer, because they're slightly different than they would be in America or in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, so, but between Germans and Austrians and Swiss, there, there wouldn't be such a big difference. So get it right in Germany. Then you probably find a local team, uh, local people who, who, who they then can execute and build on, on that kind of. So we probably, if we, if we move Smilex internationally, we would look at a local chain in Austria and we would say, okay, this is a good chain, 15 clubs. Okay, with, with, the, with the Smilex model, it would really work very well. And we, we basically um, go in there, keep the management team, take all the back office, centralize that in, in Frankfurt where we have our office and then, and then let the execution and the operations be done by that original team of the brand we, we would acquire. Hmm. Uh, how have you seen that um, that strategy work from a brand perspective? Because I guess the temptation is, you know, as you build different brands, you, you know, the, the marketing and the story and the, even maybe the people, I guess, from a barriers would be different to maybe the, the Smilex. So, you know, recruitment. So there's a lot of differences. And I, I guess that to do it well, you, you, you could end up with a lot of duplication in terms of cost to, to do it successfully. So, that, and I guess the temptation is, okay, well, well, let's centralize a lot of that stuff as well. But then, um, you know, do you get a sort of a merging of some of the brands and the values for doing that? So what, what, are, what are some of the sort of pros and cons of, of the multi-brand strategy then? Well, first, it's more common complicated and challenging that you would imagine that's mm. definitely a learning it, everything is is takes way more time if you think it takes six months double it always does that that's definitely the learning the second learning is um you need to keep your core operations that needs to be one brand i'm, I'm a sole believer that this is that that everything else i've seen has failed um 
you need to keep your um, product, your fitness product and service person. They need to be, they need to be brand specific. And I'm a big believer that you also need your HR team um, who supports the, the development of the team. They also need to be brand specific. I'm a little less inclined to say on the marketing, on the HR payroll, certainly not IT, certainly not finance, certainly not property. That that those those divisions can, can be multi brand. You know, like if you if you negotiate a lease for the one brand, you can negotiate the same for another for another brand. That's not a problem. If you look after the facility, not a problem. If you pay invoices. Uh, if you do pay staff, that's all the same. But the development of the staff, the development of the product, and the core operation need to be brand specific. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it does sound it, it, as though it can be quite complex to to manage those. And I and I, and I suppose um, you know if you look at some of the other brands that are that are out there as well, I suppose if if you get some negative issues that are happening, you know, how do you how do you sort of protect that from affecting the other ones as well? You know, if something goes wrong in one of those, it's, I suppose it's trying to trying to sort of separate them enough so that they don't all get lumped together, which um, I think has sort of happened with one of the American brands so, uh, over here um, as an example. Yeah, and I guess the personalities you have in those, that's the key. So, you know, do you get along? Like in every partnership, you know, we have always kept the original founder. That was key for us. We wanted to keep the spirit. Of course, you know, over time, maybe in two or three or four years time, and there's a next round with a new investor coming and there's management changes, that, that might change. But at this moment in time, we wanted to keep them. And what we've seen in the Corona crisis, um, you know, we went from having every month a two hour call with the brands and two weeks in between a visit to spend the day in their clubs and all that. That was the interaction I had with the brands. We went in March to a daily, including Saturday, Sunday, phone call for two hours. You know, that for six or eight weeks. And actually, you know what? We really got to know us in that time with all the ups and downs and with all the challenges. But what it really meant was, is that the one brand, you know, that did, let's say the distancing, sort out, think about the distancing, they did that extremely well, you know, and we looked at all the others and said, oh, you know what, we're just going to take this from this brand. Then the next one, they already thought about join online, you know, when, when we were still thinking, you know, will we ever open again? And they started the join online activity. So, so suddenly we were the first in Europe continuing join online, having decent join online numbers because one of the brands did that. Whereas on the other hand, you know, the one brand had all sorted because they're small and they were thinking about a plan. Okay, what happens if there's a second wave? Hmm. Look, we were not even like, we were still closing and they were thinking already what's happening when there's a second wave. So, so I think when you have smaller and bigger organization and you work tight knit together, you can actually utilize this um, to an extreme measurement. I was on a call today with them now. Now they are bi-weekly. So we, we have gone to from from daily to twice a week and once a week and now to bi-weekly. And this morning, you know, the team said, you know what, I just saw how you're doing the distancing now because the regulations change all the time. And and they said, I'm going to steal this. I'm going to steal it with pride and, and we're going to take this and we're going to adapt this. And I think we have created this kind of culture that first and foremost, one of our key principles is, is we celebrate mistakes. You know, so so we really go... Brilliant. That's it. That what a screw up. Well done. You know, let's, what do we learn from this? You know, I mean, every every call we talk about mistakes. And and we giggle about it and we laugh about it because we're going to do them anyway. You know, and if we, we are open and transparent about them and don't make a big myth about it, they don't get bigger. So 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 in a way, when, when we feel that this kind of different management teams when they're aligned under one vision, that you're open, honest, that you're looking after your teams, you're looking after your members, and and you're not looking after the last cent of profit, you know, so you just look after a decent business, how you want to be treated, then actually a multi-brand really gives you, because a boutique brand looks completely different than a mass market, a valued brand, 
you know so in a way it's it's quite it's quite exhilarating to actually mm. work and uh, being very fortunate to to lead that kind of group of people mm. so it, it it does sound as though there's a lot to get your head around certainly for for, for your position in in the organization what you, and, and it sounded like you had a great strategy and you, you had some really exciting stuff going on. What what sort of went through your mind when this COVID situation happened? And, and what did you decide was important for you to do as a leader to be focusing on when you realized, you know, shit, you know, the clubs are going to be closed down? What does this mean? Well, you know, how, what, what, what went through your mind and what are some of the key steps that you took Im- immediately as you realized you were in the middle of it all? Yeah, look, I think um, this is where it pays out when you're well connected in the industry, um, because um, and when you go to these international shows and when uh, when, you, when you meet people and you're open and straightforward, because somewhere in the world, Corona happened before you. You know, everything what happens to us, it it happens. You know, uh, happened in China first, in Australia next, and all this. So with all the relationships, I'm hugely grateful to Greg Oliver and the Australian team. I'm hugely uh, grateful to Simon Flint and the Asian team because they constantly, you know, kept the information flowing and uh, and allowed us to get insights. And and when times were dark, they said, look, it's going to come back. This is what's going to happen. So in a way, you know, we already knew in February that that this will come. We actually canceled our Ursa trip uh, um, in February. Because we knew, you know, we, we might not get home again. And, and sadly, we were right on this one. Um, uh, and um, so in a way, we kind of felt we were always ahead, you know, two or three weeks of what's going to happen. So so we had um, our closure plan ready. Um, and when we had the staggered approach um, throughout the, um, uh, that the, cl- the clubs are closing, Germany is a federal system. So you don't have, like in the UK, the whole UK closes the states, the 11 states, and we are in seven of them, they close um, separately. They're also open, stated. So in a way, um, we always felt we are ahead of the times. Um, it was challenging for me because I had that knowledge, but my team and particularly the club staff, they didn't see it coming. So we needed to educate them um, at all times um, to kind of tell them this is what's going happen we're going to close the job uh, the clubs this is what's going to happen with your salaries this is what's going to happen with freelancers but but we had the plans for all these um areas and all these departments in a way ready and we're also ready now for the next things which might come our way and this this in a way you have to manage on site in this period but you also can relax when you kind of well connect internationally and you just learn from the mistakes others are doing. I think then, you know, um, um, but of course, you know, our whole exit strategy out of the window, you know, we're not going to sell business this year, you know, which means for me, brilliant. I definitely have the job for another two years, you know, (laughs) and my management team, because if the new owner is there, you never know, you know? So, so in a way it it always has their both sides, you know? Um, um, And as, as we can see, things are coming back. You know, in the first months after opening, you know, we had 40% of sales and 40% of visitation. You know, that's a disaster. But we know from China, you know, it's going to ramp up. So now we are in week six, we're at 70% visitation and at 80, 75% sales. So, and we know they're already, you know, two, three, four weeks ahead. So it will bounce back, you know. So, so in a way, we actually used it, this whole, this whole thing now. We, this for us is probably the chance of a lifetime to accelerate changes to the business um, you would have done over two years' time. Digitalization. You know, okay, we always did it, and now we had to do it. You know, our first um, class was live three days after we closed the first club. <laughs> live class Monday. Um, um, uh, we closed on a Thursday. The first class was up Monday. On, on uh, and and you know what? We had seventy eight percent of visitation we would have had in a normal class. So we have a capacity of four and a half thousand people in a live class on a Monday. Digitally, we had seventy eight percent, which is wow. staggering. You know. Mean meanwhile, 
We had over 27,000 views of that very first class. So, of course, digital was always important, but it's now increasing. And obviously now we've put resources behind, got the filming, got the teams. We're going to, you know, we, we are live filming from Frankfurt. We're going to live film in future from Berlin and Munich and Hamburg. So, so you know, we've done and used the time to focus on those kind of initiatives. Mm. If you look back over that period, um, would you have done anything differently? Probably a hundred things. You know, we could talk for an hour for this because, you know, despite knowing what's coming, you don't, you, when you act and when you manage, you, you continue to do, you go, you go basically in a way from mistake to mistake, mm -hmm. you know, so, so you order the first masks only then to realize, oh, <laughs> they're a bit heavy, you know, because now you need to, you need to, you need to use them while training. All right. That doesn't work. So you have to order another set of masks. You know, then you, then you think about screens, then you need to think about, okay, so we do class bookings in future and you get a software. That software doesn't um, work with um, that, you know, penalties. So when you don't show for your visit, it doesn't, doesn't give you. So we have a lot of classes now and, uh, and they're booked within 10 minutes after they've gone live on the class booking app. But suddenly, you know, it's only... 50 60 percent showing and all these things when you you know the, you you make tons of mistakes and uh, and and we make mistakes even now uh, all the time so um so you need to just be agile and uh, and learn from them and move on and, and just laugh about it in a way so what do you do when you when you sort of i guess for for everybody for anyone in business it's it's been a pretty tough period but what what's your escape route where you you know how do, where, where do you sort of go and think you know damn it's been a, a tough week and we've made a bunch of these mistakes and we've got all kinds of stuff going on you know what 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 do you do to sort of allow you to sort of get off the canvas and come back fighting again the next day yeah for me it is always connect with the teams who work actually with the with the member so um, in times when you're not allowed to travel, you know, and we're all on video calls, to actually, you know, call the club and, 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 and speak with them through what they are experiencing and doing that, to actually call the people who are in the customer service department, you know, who actually speak to all the people who are connecting with our members. That has always been for me in that period a real sanctionary and, uh, and, and really re-motivate because, you know, we do strategic and we do decisions, but what does it actually mean for the people who work with the customer? And, uh, and they give you obviously instant feedback. But for me, you know, I probably have four days out of five, I have a conference call with a team which actually works with the customer. And we drag the supporting teams into it. Um, that, that has been a real, joy and a real um you know putting it putting everything into balance and and then obviously i think i've actually increased exercising um so 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 i've trained less hard um but i've trained more i've been on bike rides on runs on walks on yoga um so i've done all these things the odd push up and pull up and all that my son you know is 18 full of energy out into the world you know i did um uh, 22 pull-ups and he said daddy i'm going to beat you you know <laughs> within a month he was at 25 pull-ups three times with a 10 minute break you know so you know but so i said okay i'm not i'm not going to compete in there you know he's doing 100 you know my my little girl laura 15 you know she's obviously you know um, very good and all these um videos and TikToks and all this. I've tried to be, you know, have a bit of talent <laughs> there. I certainly don't have. So, you know, you, you get these kind of things. The family is together. No one is traveling. I live in the UK. I don't have to travel to Germany for three months. So in a way, you know, you know, we play sports together. We play other things. We cook together. In a way, it has also been really nice, you know, in a, in a, in a hard way to kind of connect with your inner circle again. And, uh, you know, do the video calls with your parents or your parents-in-law, 
you know, and I have to say, you know, my mother-in-law is much better on the video call and then I actually meet her. Um, uh, but it could be also myself, you know, so uh, I don't know how this continues. But that, that, that in a way has helped me. Mm. And what do you do? Like, like you've obviously got investors and shareholders and that to answer to and they're looking to you to say, OK, Martin, you know, what, what does the future look like? How are you, how are you with so much uncertainty and, and with clubs opening and then reclosing in certain areas as well? People talking about the second wave. How do you, how do you, um, you know, plan and forecast and budget with very very little information to go on? Because you know we've never been in this situation before. Um, how, how do you manage that uncertainty as it relates to financial planning of the of the business? Yeah, it helps that our private equity are partners of the business. You know, they I've been with them personally for six, seven, eight years now. You know, I've gone through them when they picked up Fitness First and, and when, when we've turned around the UK, supported in Asia and Australia. And, you know, so so we get along really, really well. There's a real trust element. Um, that definitely helps. Mm -hmm. um, they do understand the business model very well. They know that in the times now, because Germany is one of the few countries in the world who actually could take the direct debit. The, well, sorry, I yeah, lost you there, Martin. actually build the members. What, what was that? You cut um, off then? We, we, can, we could build the members. Fitness First and Smilex and Elchip, they could continue building the member. Mm -hmm. so, so in a way, we had the money and the revenue. You know, So we have liquidity, liquidity at this moment in time. But they know the lost joiners will really be impacting us next year. Mm -hmm. So they know the business model. So they knew immediately. And, and the good news is we, we have projections, you know, middle case, upper case, lower case. And we knew every number we put in there, it's going to be wrong. Yeah. So, so the biggest thing we got wrong was, um, you know, we thought the clubs are closed for two months. That was our expectation. Okay. It was two and a half, three months. Um, and after that, there will be a rush coming to us with joiners. Well, we heard from China and from other countries, from my friends, that's not going to happen. Yeah. So, so, but in our original model, we had that in. So we had to re-educate our owners that actually it's not going to happen. You know, that, that was a tough one, you know, because logic implies all these people are out there, they need to get fit. Immune system is the best thing you do. Mm -hmm. Why? Okay. They're not. I've not heard many who say they have better numbers than the year before. So um, we're going into summer also. also into it. So in a way, I guess you need to keep an open and honest relationship with your owner. Um, we, we are transparent. I write a board report every Friday. So Thursday I write it and, and they get the full detail of everything we do. It's a one pager, you know, never bigger than one page and it has some supporting documents. And I think information open and transparency is the most important asset you have in that time. Because I don't know the numbers. I don't know what's really going to happen. They don't know. Um, so, so we can only be open and transparent. Um, I think you need to have, you need to demonstrate that you really sincerely understand the revenue impact this will have. So this is no more, all right, I'm going to cut this cost by like 5%. And, and this is not the time for that. You know, the time is you got to make substantial changes to your operating model um, in order. So we made one of the boldest decisions I've ever made in my career in that time. Um, and, and it is go away from a commission scheme for salespeople in the gym. We always felt that the proactive sales, collect the lead on the street, on outreach, call him up, do all that. That time is phasing out. You know, digital is becoming more important. Bring a friend is more important. So we said, this is it. Because how do you run around with a mask on the street? Um, how do you ask a member in the gym with a mask? You know, th this whole thing about collecting leads and, and calling them and doing all that, that, that will change over time. You need to really convince people with the service element. And so, so we've taken that away. That's two million of costs for us out of the business. And a lot of FE salespeople, a lot, yeah? At the same time, we invested 
5 million to change our reception area to a concierge model. So we actually have no more turnstiles. So we, we've completely changed the whole look and feel of the clubs, like massive change. Like the members are coming back, turning around, thinking they're in the wrong place. Seriously, <laughs> it is, it's that mesmerizing. Think about our old hotel and you had this whole, you had the concierge at the beginning and you had the desk there and you had the queues and lines and all that, all gone. A small little desk in the middle where only one person can fit almost behind. Huge lounge and massive addition to the training space because we stole 75% of that space for training space, for functional training. <laughs> so, so, you know, a lot of party gym, <laughs> you know, a lot of uh, escape equipment. Um, so in a way, you know, we've completely transformed. Um, we've put all staff, while they were not working this three months, on e-learning to learn about fitness, to really become experts in training. How do you speak to them? They've gone through e-learnings and e-learnings. We've produced them just like, you know, like pancakes. And so there's a huge change within the business away from a proactive kind of sales kind of type towards a member-centric focus. We've tr started to do the learning programs. What is the name of the customer? What's his training goal and what's his pet, young kid, last holiday, something personal? You might think, all right, we should have that, you know, but we don't. And, you know, I don't see it in the big chains. I see it in the small boutique studios, but, you know, in the yoga halls and all that. But in the big chains, you know, we are bloody friendly and, and you know, we are that, but we're not really personal. So we decided to become the personal company. The new three-year goal is, we are the personal company, you know, we know, we know you. And, um, and we feel it's, it's the right approach for these times. So we have not only, you know, made some small adjustments, you know, we know a lot of people believe us, a lot of staff. Um, and because we need to reduce staff anyway, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, you have 10, 15% less members, 20, 30% less visitation at the moment. So you need to cut your costs. And how do you do it? You, you change towards a model what you think is the right one. And we've done that. You know, mm. so that's that's pretty um, a big, big leap for us. Um, but we know it's going to be the right one. Mm. So one of the questions I guess a lot of people are interested in, particularly, you know, there's there's a lot of markets that are still not open. I think the UK uh, today, it was announced that... Um, about another couple of weeks, they're going to open. So, what 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 are you what are your thoughts in terms of the, you know, how this how the fitness model is going to look in the future? You know, you you're one of the few people that have got the budgets, they've got the boutiques, that have got the mid market. Do do you see those all surviving? Um, if they are surviving, is it going to be different? As you know, if you if you take the boutique. For example, you know, it is based on getting a certain number of people in a relatively small space to, to make the finances work in. That's not potentially going to be possible with, with the social distancing. So in general, you know, do, what, are the, what are the sectors that you think are going to be struggling and, and, and what do you think, how do you think they're going to uh, deal with, with those changes, specifically in terms of masks and distancing that are, that are in place in a lot of areas? Well, um, there's no doubt that the boutique market, you know, with the yoga studios and the spinning studios and all that, and we will see how our berries opening go. You know, when we look at Sweden, where where they kept running with, you know, half the amount of people, but more classes, that seems to be successful and still economically good. Um, um, they they will they will suffer for a moment. But bear in mind, they have been the, the growth of the industry for the last three years. You know, I remember my time about seven years ago, I went into the, went into the US, into New York, and I typed in boutique fitness in Manhattan. And I got a kickboxing studio. You know, I, I got probably like 30 hits. And I still have the screenshot from it. I was it 18 months ago, and I typed in boutique fitness. I, I stopped counting after 300. <laughs> you know, so... So you, this is a market segment which has been growing exponentially. Naturally, it shakes out. And, and Corona is just doing this at this moment in time. So I just think this, this would have happened more naturally in the next two or three years anyway in some markets. But it's now getting accelerated. So the fitness will survive. 
You know, um, um, does it mean that that model won't uh, won't be successful? No, it doesn't, because there are numerous places, including Germany, where there is no real boutique market yet. You can mm. still type in boutique fitness into your Google, and you don't, you know, you'll find maybe in Berlin, you know, two million people or three million people, and you maybe find sixty or seventy or eighty studios, and it should have five hundred. So in a way, I think um, it will just reorganize the market and unfortunately a lot of one single side operators you know a yoga studio or, or a spin studio they won't have the firepower so there will be a lot of consolidation going on like it has been in the gym business um, but but that market is hugely attractive and uh, and you know one day we will have a vaccine also we shouldn't forget retail same will happen there. It will go more digital. We know that. So in a way, there will be more and more retail spaces available, great, uh, you know, high street spaces for those kind of models. So actually, it will put um, the, the visibility of our product into people's mind. And, and that will help the overall business. When you have a yoga studio, Pilates studio, spin studio, run studio, you know, a kettlebell studio on the high street, People will go, oh, hang on a second, that's too specific to admit, where is actually the big gym? So mm -hmm. so I think that will continue to drive, it will get bigger visibility that, you know, and, and uh, rents will be more affordable. So I think, you know, it will come back in two or three years time. We are with Exponential, extremely well positioned and Barry's, so, so we feel good, just not for now. Mm. If you then have the low cost segment, that is the segment which which obviously has been growing fast you know, um, um, is it increased the penetration in all the markets. And naturally, when jobs are less secure, maybe unemployment goes up, uh, spending power and all this, that market will grow, you know. will will and, and they are also communicating, you know, in, in Germany, it's McFit and, 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 and FitEx and others and Smilex. They, they have the best numbers on the joiners at the moment. Um, so, so in a way, that model will be short term, um, will continue its acceleration. So we believe there will be M&A opportunities. Um, some smaller chains might struggle. So we might come in with our firepower. Um, and the mid-market, you know, everybody talks about the mid-market. What people forget is it's by a country mile the biggest market segment. <laughs> so how can we say it won't survive? You know, I mean, when you think about airlines, you know, which which is a premium airline? Which one do you know? And which is the you know, mid-market one? You know, and what's the low cost? There's massive around mid-market airlines. So so in a way, that market segment will always be successful. We just got bloody complacent. You know, fitness first. And I'm one of those senior managers. We just got cocky, complacent, uh, uh, full of ourselves, not looking after the member well, not more importantly, even not looking after the staff very well. You know, so, so so I think, you know, when we do these things right, we will be successful, no doubt. And I think mm. everybody who, who, who approaches that way will be successful. Mm. Do you think there's going to be a lot of casualties still to, to come? Like we're starting to see it in America. Um, you know, are you seeing this in Central Europe as well? Yeah, look, I mean, reality is, you know, work from home will change our life. So So when you are in an area, city center, you know, and, and so we are in Frankfurt city center, you know, I mean, 90%, 80% of the staff is working there. Mm. So naturally, you know, companies go, look, you know, we have a corporate membership, but it, it, it won't work, you know. So, so in a way, depending on your location, there will be casualties in the short term um, because of that work, work pattern. On the other hand, we see clubs outside Frankfurt in the living areas suddenly are getting busier and busier and, and more occupied because obviously the members live somewhere. Mm. So, so in a way, it really depends on where you are. Our, look, nobody knows. My personal estimate after speaking a lot, just putting you know my thumb out, is 15% of operations will cease in the next two years as a casualty. So that's that's a big number. Mm. But... It will be a lot of small ones and it will be in the big ones, you know, the ones who weren't successful as a single side anyway. You know, even we, we carry some clubs with us who are not really 100% successful. So that's the casualties that will speed it up. There will be another 10, 15% which will be consolidated. Yeah, um, but, but I'm a true believer that 
in, in, well, as a thumb rule, every month we were closed will take us a year to get back. <laughs> so in a way, we were closed two and a half months. We believe in two and a half years, we are at the revenue levels, the membership levels, the profitability levels where we are now. Probably higher profitability because we really address our cost base. You know, so so um, so that should come back within 18 months, half the time, because we are reducing the cost. But ultimately, revenue wise, we believe it's going to take that time. With that in mind, the the digital side, then, you know, you, you hear a lot about home fitness and we've certainly been um, benefiting from people buying equipment at home. And you see the, the success of people like Peloton and Mirror and all those others. Do, do, do you think that that's going to prevent people because they've spent a lot of money and kitted out the home gym? Do you think that's going to prevent people from coming back? Or do you think that that, that gyms are always going to be a place because people want to, that, that community part of it? I think it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Because we all know who exercises at home or who does a sport is more likely to join a gym or a boutique studio than the people who don't. It's, it's natural. And we know it. We have seen it in 20 years ago in URSA studies. We've seen it 10 years ago in URSA studies. We've seen it in all the other studies. We know it from our studies. Look, what do I have at home? I have a bike at home, yeah, for, for the normal bike. I have a stepper at home, you know. Um, I have all the dumbbells, all the pull-ups, all the... The, the funky stuff or some CrossFit workouts, you know, I have it all at home. But you know what? It's bloody boring <laughs> to train not with your mates and with your work colleagues and to get the atmosphere and to maybe use the sauna or, or jump in the pool or, you know, it's just, I live in the UK. I wasn't allowed out, but I was always allowed out back to Germany as a German, but I was not allowed to get back in because of 14 days of quarantine. Last Monday, they announced, okay, Monday in a week, so yes, uh, this Monday, you can come back and, and, you, um, and you don't have to go into quarantine. Tuesday, I was on the flight. <laughs> yeah? uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, I was in 22 gyms, L Gym and Fitness First, and I loved it. I loved the atmosphere. I loved meeting the people. I loved speaking to the members, you know. And, and you know, it was brilliant because obviously the heavy users are all back. You know, if you if you go one third of your membership is the ones, you know, whatever you do, they're going to come anyway. You know, they, they come before you even open, they want to get in. Yeah, so they're, they're all back anyway. And then, and then you have the one third who never come. You know, they actually don't know. Oh, you're closed, you know. Um, maybe it's only 15%, whatever, but there is an amount. And then there's the people in the middle, you know, who, who you kind of, you know, the couch is my best friend and uh, I have this TV show and I can't do this now. And and getting those back into the gym and when they come in and they go and, and you speak to them at reception and you sp speak to them on the gym floor, that they really like it. They said, look, the online bit, I, you've done a good job and you know all the partners you had you know we had we were a big partner of les mills and all that brilliant but you know what in that gym you know it's cool and and, and it's it's cleaner than ever <laughs> you've, you've painted everything it looks bad shinier than ever you know the your staff seem to be friendlier than ever you know so it's it's brilliant and i really enjoyed it i really enjoyed working out again you know, in the gym and, you know, I mean, how do you do, you know, I don't know how you call it in English, when five people on the one side and five people on the other side pull a thing. Tug and, of war, yeah. <laughs> tug of war. I love that in the gym. You know, we have all these things around, you know, you take, you took challenges, you know, um, a big, you know, you walk up to the big member and I say, can I help you putting that weight onto onto your piece? And then you pretend that you can't even lift it. I mean, I love all that stuff, you know, and you can't do that at home. You know, there's only so much you can do. So I think that, you know, it, it will never compensate for that. And it might be in the short term and people are insecure. But we are actually finding that um, we have more people now who use the gym and try it out than before so so our people who have not been in the gym in the last four weeks since we're open now for six weeks is a smaller percentage than it has ever been before that tells you something and that gives you a lot of confidence that we have the right product mm. 
So two questions then, just as we as we uh, wrap up then, Martin. So um, what what's your thoughts in terms of how long it's going to get back to a reasonable level of, of normal in you know across all your brands? You know, how, you think it's going to be a, a sort of a three month end of the year? Is it going to be twelve months? I know you you gave the example of you know one one year for every month, but you know if you if you had to predict as an industry, you know, when, when do you think we're going to, we're going to sort of have some normality again? When we have a vaccine. vaccine. Really? Really? And yeah. then it needs to be applied. You know, the, the reality is um, we will always get hotspots now. Um, look, they originally said, you know, you need a certain percentage of the population of the civilization in the country to get this. Um, then they found out it, you might get it twice. When we look at the global numbers, you know, how many people got it and then how many people live on the planet, it's pretty obvious that we have that we are not in the first wave. There is no such thing than the first, the second and the third wave. There just is a wave now, you know, in, the, in, in waves, if you do surfing, um, you know, waves come like this. <laughs> They come in sets. We are just in a set of waves, and uh, and it will go up and down. That's why you know the US, some of the are closing. We have in Germany a city, which is which opened and now closed again, and it will be more regional, and and, and they will look at the hotspots. So and this will continue for a long, long time. Um, but we do have, you know, we do have um, in in Elgin and, and Smilex, we have 100% of the visits than we had last year. So, so in a way. And, and in that region, you don't have a mask between the training equipment and you don't need to wear a mask on the training equipment. So it really depends on the local regulations, um, how how easy and how fast it, it, it is. And, and I think um, the new normal with the distancing will be, it just, it's just gonna be the way it is. If you probably need three months to adjust to this. You know, when you go to restaurants, when you go to shops and all this, at the moment, it still feels all a bit weird. But in three months, it won't. It's just going to be like this. It's not going to be called the new normal. It's just going to be, that's how it is. So so in a way, I'm quite relaxed on this. People are, you know, humans are very adaptive to their circumstances. And, uh, you know, um, as you said, you know, I come from a country, Germany, who has definitely more sunshine than the UK, mm -hmm. even where I live. And you adapt to that. You know what you do? You make sure your holidays are always in sunshine areas. You don't, <laughs> don't compromise on that. So I've been more to places which are definitely hot. You know, um, in, in a way, um, you adapt to things. And I think, you know, people are survivors and, uh, and, and, and people will take the new technologies and the new activities and they will, they will, they will utilize it. Personally, um, I will travel less. No doubt, because video conferencing, all this has see, has shown that you can have a real impact. So I will have more time with my family. V brilliant mm. to do something like this. And I know people see it similar. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, the, um, I'm a very optimistic, forward looking person. And the teams I work with, I'm lucky that they are similar. So, you know, we, we are quite relaxed in a way. Um, mm. um, it, it's, it's definitely the biggest challenge we ever had. And we have no solution for it. And you have to redefine everything you do on again and again and again. But in a way, um, you know, you also get used to this kind of uh, uh, um, work and activity. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting you say you, you made some big changes and things that probably should have been made before. But, yeah. you know, there's been nothing to force you to do it. And, and, and I guess, you know, whilst it's, you know, it's, it's not great, what's happening, you know, particularly with the, you know, people have been personally affected by it. I, I do think from a business perspective, there's, you know, the, the companies that come out are going to be a lot better. And the services, as you said, you know, your, your client, your members are they saying the clubs are cleaner, the staff are happier, you know, that it, it's, it's probably put your business into a different level. So um, I think it's good to try and as dark as it probably gets sometimes for businesses to sort of hold on to that, um, <laughs> you know, hold on to that sort of a uh, view about it, it can be better. Well, we are in an industry who sits at the heart of the solution. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, do I want to be an airline executive? Do I want to do the big ships on the ocean? 
no, I don't want to do that. You know, so so there are obviously industry which will be significantly affected, um, and, and you know, but but we are really just the source of, you know, when we execute our product well, and and there's numerous examples in this great industry, um, of, of a lot of colleagues and a lot of brands who are doing it brilliantly, that that people will see the benefit, and they will understand that being active. Look, we called. When we reopened, we called it um, 13 weeks of Christmas are over, you know? So because usually you have two weeks of Christmas, <laughs> 10 days or something. We had 30. People are overweight, unfit and unhealthy. You, you, you can't beat around the bush. Okay, they're running. Now it's good weather in Europe. So obviously people are outside. There's more people. You can't buy a bike. You know, I mean, try to buy a used bike or a new bike. It's difficult. It's challenging. You know, try to get a bike repaired. Impossible. Try to buy, you know, trainers, sneakers, running gear. This is all sold out in a way, you know. Home equipment. I mean, amazing. You know, Peloton, brilliant. Love it. You know, but it it will come back. There will be dark times. The weather will change. The, the You know, um, even California will get some... You know, some rain and, and some, some colder days and some gusty winds. You know, people want to connect with other people. And, uh, and, and I think when they are with like-minded people, that's what they do in a gym. I think that will, that will carry us and that will carry this industry. And, uh, and, and I'm hugely optimistic. I think it, it, it dips us, but it, out of it, we're going to come stronger and faster and and and, uh, and and really more impact to the people. I think mm. people really will understand that over time. Mm. You'd agree. It's certainly a great industry to be in to to solve what's going on at the moment. That's that's for sure. So, final question then, Martin. Um, escape your limits is about escaping what you've believed is impossible and gone on to make it possible. What would be an example of where you've um, escapes your your own personal limits in one way when i originally met my wife i never thought i had a chance to actually be with her you know that certainly was punching way above way above my my weight so in a way i'm very glad that she has been my partner for these over these you know it's next next week it's 20 years married but 26 years together my family and all this you know you, you can never underestimate that the surrounding network you build around yourself how important that becomes so i think but from a from a more you know business point of view um i have never believed that that you can actually push people um and they can push you um in the in the hard times in in the times we had now to actually accelerate again and to, to and to really you know put even more thought and more effort in a way into something to make things better than before you know this this constant um regenerating um how we manage who we are how we do i think it's it's really something where we um where we push the limit um and on, on some other private things, you know, doing some skydiving, you know, if you haven't done it, do it. <laughs> you know, it's going to push your limits. Do do bungee. You know, we've been to New Zealand uh, over Christmas and, uh, and you know, it's amazing. It is, you know, you die and then you somehow didn't die. But it, it's those kind of things, you know, um, um, which I think the time has shown that life can change pretty quickly. So, so we will, we have now thought about what are the crazy things, you know, we can do. So we know that, you know, we will probably um, work from different places going forward. You know, we will probably, you know, just, you know, if you have another lockdown, we might go and set ourselves up entirely different than how we set ourselves up this time. Because we go, okay, this is going to take a while. So, so we're really constantly pushing on, on the areas which, which, which our normality, we believe, um, is there. I learned a, summer, a backflip somersault for my 18-year-old son and for my daughter in that, in that period. 
I really? never thought I could do a somersault on a trampoline. Never, <laughs> you know. Um, um, I, I went on the, uh, I went on the, um, on the, um, what do you call it with the, um, not the surfing, but the kite surfing, you know. And you know, I flew off. I had no chance, you know. So you know, we 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 constantly trying to do these little these little things, you know, in order to kind of push push our limits here. Because life is just too short, you know. You you know, uh, every day is every day you wake up, you know. So that so that's how we treat it, you know. Brilliant. Let's do this. Let's enjoy the day, and next day do something crazy again. Fantastic. Well, it's I, it, it sounds like it's um, important to have that kind of um, fun loving um, positive mindset um, to you know to to be able to sort of inspire uh, many people like you do and. Um, and, and yeah, testament because I've, like I say, I've known you for a, a long time, and you've 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 really done some impressive things, and you've been very consistent. So um, yeah, hats off to what you've achieved there, Martin. And I I look forward to seeing um, to following um, your journey over the next few years as well, and seeing what exciting stuff you're going to be doing next. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, and likewise, you know, it has been a pleasure to to see you around the shows and your teams. I think you know. We are always only as good as our teams are, and, and you certainly have surrounded yourself with a brilliant uh, set of uh, individuals. And um, it has been a pleasure to be here. An honor. I've looked at the list of people who have already been here, so you know I'm very um, proud to have made that list. And uh, and I hope it's worthwhile for the listeners. And and thank you so much for that opportunity. Thank you so much, Martin. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.